welcome you here to our midweek service. It's been a wonderful week already. We had a great day on Sunday worshiping the Lord together. And then last night, a great group of ladies here in the ladies' Bible study. And then as well, people out on visitation. And so it's been a productive week already. And looking forward to God meeting with us here uh, this evening. I, I don't believe I see any visitors in the room tonight. But if, uh, if you didn't get a bulletin and you'd like a prayer bulletin, just raise your hand and let the ushers know. And they'll put a prayer bulletin in your hand so you can have that uh, for the service. We'll go over that here in just a few moments. Please pray for Pastor and Marsha and the family. Uh, they're away uh, this week, and they'll be returning. And looking forward to them being back with us on Sunday and pray for them as they're away. Let's go ahead and stand, and we'll have a word of prayer. And then after we pray, we'll turn to 391 in our hymnals, Trust and Obey. And uh, we'll go ahead and sing together, trust and obey, right after our prayer. Father, we do thank you for bringing us here safely this evening. We thank you uh, for the way that you worked in our hearts and the services on Sunday. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, for the work that was done even yesterday, Lord, at the ladies' Bible study, the fellowship, the time in your word, the time in prayer. And then, Lord, for the visits you gave us last night on visitation. And I know there's many other things going on. Uh, personally in people's lives as they go out into the community and witness as well. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, work uh, through each and every one of these ministries to have your will accomplished. Lord, we do thank you that we can trust you uh, with every need in our life. And Lord, we thank you for the direction that you provide. We pray now that you would be with us tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd be pleased as we lift up the song to you, Lord, that we do so with the spirit of praise and worship. And Lord, I pray as well, Lord, that you would be in the preaching this evening, Lord, that you'd speak to hearts. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Number 391, your hymnals, Trust and Obey. Trust and Obey, we'll sing first, second, and last verse on page 391. page right across from that, page 392. Page 392, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We'll sing it together, first, second, and last verse on page 392.
at this time and in just a second we'll go through our bulletin and look at some announcements here but I was thinking as we were talking about those who are watching us via live stream right now and what a blessing that is to have that live stream option technology I don't know about you but technology is something that it's a huge blessing sometimes and there's other times I just can't stand it you know and uh, that's primarily because I can't figure out how to work it most of the time but it is a blessing when you're unable to be here to have the option of tuning in at home. And tonight, I trust that Mrs. Fernandez is probably watching the service. She tunes in quite frequently. And today is her 90th birthday. And so we want to recognize that tonight. And we're going to sing happy birthday. And Brother Gideon is going to come back up and lead us in happy birthday because we want it to sound good. And so Brother Gideon is going to come. He's going to lead us in happy birthday. We're going to sing to Mrs. Fernandez and hope that, th that this brings her a little joy on her 90th birthday. Amen. Let's sing it all together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mrs. Fernandez. Happy birthday to you. Wonderful. Gideon actually talked to me beforehand, and he said, are we going to say Mrs. Fernandez, or are we going to say God bless you? And then we never gave you any instructions. That's always confusing when you sing it in church, isn't it? But I hope that was a blessing to Mrs. Fernandez, and I know she faithfully watches here and even calls uh, faithfully to find out what's going on in the ministry here. And uh, she's a blessing, and we want to be a blessing to her. Let's look at the bulletin for just a moment here before we receive our offering. And you notice some... Uh, new requests added there in bold print, and John Loveless, Ruby Riley's son, is at Duke Hospital there at Duke University, so let's uh, pray for him. And then Del Skurlock is at CAMC there in Charleston in the hospital, and Jack Vance, Jason Vance's dad, is at Health South in Princeton. And so let's pray for all three of these in the hospital, that the doctors would have wisdom and that God's healing hand would be upon them. And then Julie Hobbs has been added to the list. This is Bill Dorsey's sister. She fell and broke her hip. And so pray for her as she recovers uh, from that injury. And then Sarah Tony is recovering from surgery, and she's doing therapy. And so let's pray for her. And then, of course, we know as well, um, I'm blanking right, here, right now. I, I apologize. Uh, but Mrs. Brogan, Shirley Brogan as well, is going through therapy right now and trying to heal up as well, so let's keep her in our prayers as well. You see those listed there for extended care, and if you ever want an address so that you could contact them, uh, you can call the church office. We'd be happy to give that to you. And then our church ministry of the week is our soul-winning ministry. We had a good night uh, last night. I didn't share this with you. We went out with the teens, and I told you we had gone out with the teens and had some good visits prior to vacation Bible school. But what I didn't tell you is that we actually went to Gideon and Rachel's neighborhood one day, and we had a lot of people open the door, which is always a blessing when you find people at home on visitation. We got to speak to a lot of people that day. And for Vacation Bible School, in my fifth and sixth grade class, I had a ninth grade young man show up for, for Vacation Bible School from that neighborhood. He lives right across the street from Gideon. And he got saved that night uh, after the service. And uh, it's a blessing uh, when you see that God blesses faithfulness when you go out and you do what God has asked you to do, and you see the fruit of it, and that was such a blessing. And uh, we're praying for him and hoping to see him back in church. And Vacation Bible School is great. We did have some young people come back and be in Sunday school classes on Sunday morning, and so that was wonderful. Our deacon and family are Greg and Alicia Dillon, so let's pray for them. Our shut-in of the week is Leona Gibson, and uh, you can see her address there at the Hidden Valley Nursing Home. And then the missionary of the week are Paula Sarah Johnson, 
uh, there in Amori, Japan, and hopefully it stops snowing finally for them. I don't know about you, but when I was outside mowing grass today, I could have taken some snow. It was, it's pretty warm out there. But uh, pray for the, the Johnsons doing a, a wonderful work there in Japan. And then our Bible Hour teacher is Teresa Dennison and the toddlers. And let's keep these in mind. And we'll pray for these a little bit later in the service. And then announcements. Uh, Father's Day is coming up this Sunday. And so we will recognize each dad who is here in attendance. And we uh, encourage you to be here and invite somebody else to come with you. And each dad who comes, each father who comes will get a special gift and we'll also recognize the oldest and the youngest father in attendance. Uh, Scott Pauley will be preaching for us all day on Sunday, Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service. He usually saves Mother's Day for Cranberry Baptist Church, but this year he saved Father's Day for Cranberry Baptist Church. So looking forward to hearing Brother Scott here uh, this upcoming Sunday. And then of course, there's a note there about Go and Tell Tuesdays. We've changed our visitation from Saturdays to Tuesdays throughout the remainder of the summer. Uh, we meet at 6.30 p.m. up in the great room, and then we divide and go out and uh, go out with the gospel into our community, invite people to come to church, and invite people to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so be prayerful about that, and if you can be here, uh, we'd love to see you there for that. And then there's a teen activity notice there, and a youth Sunday coming up, a lot for the teens uh, this month, and then God and Country Day coming up uh, there in July. I'm looking forward to that. That's always a wonderful time together. We'll ask our ushers to come forward at this time to receive the offering, and I'm uh, thankful for Matt Belcher and for all of our teenagers, and I've said multiple times, I wish that I could play a musical instrument. I'm not very uh, musically talented. I love to sing about as much as any person I've ever met. I, I love singing. People just don't love to hear me sing, and uh, at least my wife does not love to hear me sing, and Lucy doesn't like to hear me sing either. She's been around a lot when I was singing, and I don't get a lot of positive feedback when I sing. But uh, I, I trust that the Lord likes to hear a joyful noise, so I, I, I trust that it's a blessing to him. But I, I've, always, I've often thought I'd like to learn to play an instrument. But you know what? To learn to play an instrument, it takes a lot of work and a lot of practice. And I appreciate these young people who have put so much work and so much practice into it, and then they're using the talents and abilities that they've developed for the Lord. And that's a blessing. That's, that's encouraging to my heart. I know it's encouraging your heart as well. Let's pray for the offering. Father, we do thank you for all that you've given to us. You've blessed us immensely above and beyond what we deserve. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And Lord, we thank you for even the physical blessings that you give to us. Now, Lord, I pray that as we give back tonight, that we do so with a cheerful heart. And Lord, we pray that you would take these funds and that we would use them wisely, uh, Lord, to reach the lost in our community and Lord, to spread the gospel. We ask and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this evening, we're privileged to have Brother Burks with us, uh, Pastor Burks, pastor for 36 years, uh, for seven years down in Welch, and then for 29 years at Crow Baptist Church, and we're so thankful that he's willing to fill in and fill the pulpit this evening. I'm looking forward to, I, I was going to say I was looking forward to hearing what you have to say, but I'm not going to be up here. They're looking forward to hearing what you have to say, what the Lord's laid on your heart, and you just mind the Holy Spirit, and we're praying for you, brother. Okay, 
Am I good? Well, there's none good, no, not one, but <laughs> is this on? I guess is what I should have said. Well, I figured this out, okay? Uh, last year, uh, Brother Roger went on vacation, and I got to come on Wednesday night and do a Bible study. Now he's gone on vacation again, and I get to come on Wednesday night and do a Bible study. So after tonight, we're going to see how it goes, and I might just try to get him to take a vacation, you know, more often. And then I'll be here on Wednesday night, okay? <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's good to be here, good to see you. An old guy used to say, it's better to be seen than be viewed. So I, anymore, I wonder even about that. But uh, I'm going to get you to turn your Bible tonight to uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, very familiar passage of Scripture. And uh, somebody said preach and somebody said teach, but Brother Roger said do a Bible study. And so that's what we will do. And then there's other people who would say, what's the difference, right? <laughs> Not a lot, but there is a difference. In preaching, you have uh, X amount of time, usually about 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, you've got to give the gospel, but at the same time, you have to edify the Christian. And there are certain points you have to hit, and don't ever go over time, okay? One, you don't get paid for it, and the other is people don't appreciate it. Uh, but in teaching, you can slow down, and you can belabor a point, or points, or a, or a topic, or a passage. And so tonight, uh, I'll let you figure out which one we're going to do. But Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, the Lord laid on my heart for you tonight. And we'll look at verses 1 through 6. And then we'll be going to another passage of Scripture. And we'll pretty much be staying there so you don't have to turn back and forth a lot. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. And I want you to focus on that, just that phrase tonight, pleasing God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you, Lord, for this service tonight, where we can come and gather around the infallible and inspired word of God. We pray, Lord, that you would help us tonight. God, that you would surely help us, Lord, to say only those things that are necessary that the Holy Spirit might lay upon our hearts as we've studied and God, that uh, you would lay it upon the hearts of each individual tonight. Lord, having interpreted your word, Lord, that we might seek to apply it to our own lives. And God, we'll leave the results in your hands and we'll give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, verse 1 here, if you ever wondered what faith is, and of course, faith is uh, critical to the Christian life. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves the gift of God. So, uh, I think a lot of modern churches have kind of got things confused. Uh, they think you're saved by praying. Okay, It's always repeat this prayer after me. And if you can repeat that prayer, I guess, sufficiently or enough to impress them, then they'll declare you saved and going to heaven. But the Bible never says that. It says we're saved by faith. But the faith that we're saved by has to have an object. And that object is the person of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he's done to secure our salvation. The Bible tells us in four different places the just shall live by faith. So faith is critical, and faith is mentioned a lot in the Scripture. But Hebrews 11 1 gives the definition of what faith is, or at least it gives the description of what faith is. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
And so faith then really is believing something even though you've never seen it. You see, it doesn't take much faith to, uh, to believe something that you're seeing, but something that you've never seen. Uh, I've never seen God. I wasn't there when he created the universe. I've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't there when they hung him on the cross. I wasn't there when he rose again from the dead. But I believe that, and that's what faith does for us, uh, the evidence of things not seen. And faith will cause you to do that. But staying on this subject of faith, this topic of faith tonight, you'll notice verse 6, what it says. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we're talking tonight about God-pleasing faith. And uh, as we said, salvation is by faith. And I believe that in these perilous times we live in, and we are living in these perilous times. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Dangerous times, that's what it means. And we're there. Not, we're going to be there. We're there right now. This is the most dangerous time that has ever been upon the face of this earth, right now, where we're living in it. It's the most exciting time that's ever been on the face of this earth because we could see the Lord at any moment. And so we have to keep that in mind. And in particular, we need to live by this God-pleasing faith that he speaks about here. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You cannot please God without faith. And it's a particular type of faith. Now, here's what I find. It's uh, better illustrated sometimes than it is talked about. And I found a passage, I believe, that illustrates it perfectly. And that's the one I want to get you to turn to. is in Luke chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke and, and chapter 5. And we're going to illustrate this God-pleasing faith tonight with this passage of Scripture. Luke chapter 5, and we'll begin here in verse 1. I know you've read this if you've been saved any amount of time. And it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. Now, I guess one of the high points of this passage of Scripture is the great catch of fish after, after they had fished all night, taken nothing. Then at, at the word of the Lord, they go out and they, they enclose this great catch of fish. Now, these men had that kind of faith that pleases God, and God rewarded them for it. I think that's probably what we would have to say that that would be our conclusion about this. Now, God is a very particular God. I believe we could all say amen to that, okay? He's particular. If you don't think he's particular, read the Old Testament. And you'll find out when they go to talking about all those different sashes and tashes and, and length of boards and kind of materials and all of this over and over and over and over. And I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? Now, I don't know how, what you do when you read all of that, talking about the tabernacle and this and that, and it gets a little redundant when you're reading it, really. But I think, what, what's God trying to say here? Well, he's, he's saying it. He's not trying to say it. He's saying it, that he is a particular kind of God. And, uh, but it takes a particular kind of faith to please this particular God. Now, everybody has some kind of faith, okay? Everybody. The Bible says he's dealt to, dealt to every man a measure of faith. So everybody then evidently has enough faith within themselves to be saved if they would. But people put their faith in different things. In tomorrow, when the Bible specifically says we don't know what's going to be going on tomorrow, so don't, don't even think about that. Some people put their faith in things. 
Some people put their faith in the government. Some people put their faith in their IRAs and all of this. I, I tell you, it's a bad time to be putting your faith in those things. Maybe even religious faith. Okay, maybe even religious faith. Based upon some idea of God. They don't know God, but they have, have an idea of God. And so they put their faith in that. It could be faith in the church. It could be faith in the things that they do at church. It could be faith in baptism. It could be faith in, a, in the Lord's Supper. It could be faith in, a, in the preacher. It could be faith in a lot of different things. But very few people have the kind of faith that pleases God. Even religious faith. If, it, if, if, if that faith is not placed in the proper truth, it will not please God. Now, I was, uh, my mom and dad were born in McDowell County. I lived in McDowell County a while. I pastored in McDowell County. And McDowell County is, is odd in one sense, maybe more than one, but in this one in particular. They have snake handling churches in McDowell County. My uncle, by marriage, was a snake handling preacher. I remember my, my dad and I left Maryland one time and came and stayed all night at that house, and we got in the bed. I was, I was probably 15, 16 years old, and my dad said, get down there and look under the bed and see what you can see. Is there any cages down there or boxes or anything? And he, he thought maybe they stored those snakes under the bed. No. Uh, needless to say, I didn't sleep very good that night. But uh, I've seen a lot of pe people in the uh, snake handling churches talk to a lot of them, and it's always about their faith, their faith. Faith to take up the serpent, they say, and they do. Faith to uh, handle fire, take fire and, and just weave in and out of it. Uh, faith to drink poison, and, uh, and they have this faith. But that kind of faith doesn't please God. And we've seen the results of all of that. But they're proud of their faith. And they tell you, you don't have any faith. So even religious faith, even if it's a religious nut, okay, it doesn't amount to anything if it's not the kind of faith that pleases God. So no matter how strong or sincere a person's faith may be, if that faith is not according to the Word of God, it's not the kind of faith that God's going to accept. Now here we find in verse 5 the kind of faith that pleases God. And it is also the kind of faith, and, and this is what I want, I'm sure it's what you want, it's the kind of faith that God rewards. Notice what he says, Master, we have toiled all the night and taken nothing. Here's the first point. God-pleasing faith begins when all other faith has failed. Master, we've toiled all the night, taking nothing. Well, let me ask you this. Why did they fish all night before they gave up? Think about that. Well, they had faith they were going to catch some fish. They had experience. That was their occupation, by the way. That, that's what they did for a living. They were confident. I mean, they, their, whether their family ate or not depended on whether they caught fish or not. And so what kind of faith did they have then? Well, uh, they had faith in their ability as fishermen. They had faith in the abundance of the lake. Now, this Lake Genesaret, the Sea of Galilee, it's all the same thing. It's a freshwater body of water, but, but it's huge. It's huge, and those boats are out there continually, and the fish just keep coming. I, I guess it's like that lake down South Carolina produces all those catfish. I mean, it just, the fish keep coming, they keep catching them. And so they had that kind of uh, faith in, in the abundance of the lake. Uh, they had faith in their equipment. You know, it was a hard job. It wasn't like us going to throw a spinning reel out in there and just, you know, back and forth. They actually took nets. They would divide them amongst the boats. They'd drag that net across through the water, and whatever they enclosed, that's what they got. And they would do that repeatedly, repeatedly. And so they had faith in their equipment. And, and they had faith in the amount of time they had all night. They could catch some fish. They had, they had faith. You can't get away from that. But why did they give up then? Why did they come in and say, we've toiled all night and haven't caught anything then? Well, because their faith ran out. 
And it comes a time, I don't know if you've ever, if any of you people have ever uh, deer hunted uh, from a tree stand or a blind or whatever, or fished at night, catfished, you always expecting you're going to shoot something or catch something, and uh, you're just sure of it, and then all of a sudden the day's gone, and you're thinking, well, how much longer am I going to hold out here, you know? Uh, and then you usually say, I usually say something like, uh, 15 more minutes, right? And then 15 minutes runs out, and you say, ah, 15 more minutes. And then you, oh, no, but eventually, you just got to give it up, right? You, got, you just got to. And then Jesus says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Now, catch this. The same fisherman, the same lake, the same equipment, and a whole lot less time. And Peter, always the one who put himself out in front, Peter says, Master, that's what we've done. Fished all night, haven't, haven't caught anything. And when he says that, what he's saying is we. In other words, he's, he's pointing himself out. He's saying, trained, trained fishermen have toiled out there where the fish are. We know where they are. We've been out there all night, and we've toiled. That word toiled means hard labor. We've worked at it hard. All night, we've made pass after pass after pass after pass up and down this lake. And we haven't caught a thing. We've taken nothing. All their faith is exhausted. Everything that they trusted in as professional fishermen has failed. And all, everything's the same except Jesus. And when Jesus ex ex exerts himself into a situation, things are definitely going to change. When you have faith in him, things can get different quickly. Yet, he says, you say go out one more time. Now, Still in verse 5, God-pleasing faith progresses when obedience to God overcomes doubt. He said this word, nevertheless. Nevertheless. Now, Peter had doubts. I don't know if you've ever had doubts or not. But let me tell you this. Doubt has to exist before faith can overcome it. And we're all guilty. Doubt your own abilities. I can't do it. And I've come to that conclusion a long time ago. I can't do it. Whatever it is, if it's to serve God in whatever capacity, I can't do it. If God doesn't help me do it, it, it will not get done. I have no confidence in my own ability to do anything for the Lord. But we do it anyway when we have God-pleasing faith. Faith overcomes our doubt. We say... We can't do it, but then we look to God and we say, but God can do it. Now, Abraham, uh, Paul quotes him, says, against hope, believed in hope. It's kind of like when the man came to Jesus and he said, uh, he said my son, you know, he's, uh, he's possessed. And uh, he was told to believe. And he said, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Within each one of us, well, it might have belief or faith, but we also have some doubt to go along with it. We just don't know. Paul said in Romans 8, 24 and 25, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Now, at this point here in this account, Peter has forgotten about catching fish. He's give up on catching fish. He's going out for one reason. He's going out to please the Lord. And this is where you'll see things begin to change. Maybe he's even going to try to humor the Lord. Because after all, what's he know about fishing? Peter knows about fishing. So he said, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it for you. His desire to make the Lord happy was bigger than his desire to catch fish. And so the, the fish became secondary to doing the will of God in his life. So he believed uh, good would come out of it, one way or the other. You know the first step to evangelize people, 
to win people to the Lord. Uh, the, fir the first step to that is finding God's will and doing it. People say, find out God's will. No, know God's will. But it's not enough to know God's will. We have to be obedient to God's will when he makes it known. Otherwise, what good is it? I say, I know what God wants me to do. I, I know for sure what God wants me to do. Well, then, guess what? I need to be doing it, don't I? So if I'm not going to do it, what good does it do me to know God's will? This is the time of year graduation service has been going on, high school, college, and all that. If you went to all of those young people and asked them, what is God's will for your life? I wonder how many could tell you what God's will is. And this is also the time of year, the month of June, when most people get married. Something about June, people want to get married in June. But if you went to all of those who were going to get married and asked them, what is God's will for your life? I wonder what they'd say. You see, to know God's will is one thing, to do God's will is another thing. And then he said something else. Nevertheless, at thy word, God-pleasing faith is rooted in the evidence of God's word. At thy word, he said, at thy word. God-pleasing faith is not blind faith. It is based upon the evidence of the word of God. If you would review your life, if you would give yourself a test and see exactly what you believe and why, you ask yourself the question, why am I believing it? Is the evidence found in God's word? Or is this just something I heard, it sounded good, and I want to go with it, okay? Then uh, that's the difference. Don't do anything contrary to the Word of God. I tell you, I've told young people for years, look, as they're growing up, and of course, you know, boys get attracted to girls, and girls get attracted to boys. That's just the way it is, okay? It's the way it was when I was young, and I guess that's the way it is now. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it's always going to be. But when it comes down uh, to that, then uh, you have to ask yourself, what's God's word say? I've told them many times, look, if you're a believer, don't go out here making dates with unbelievers. There's nothing going to come of it except tragedy. That's all that's going to happen. No matter how beautiful they are, no matter how handsome they are, no matter how cool they are, it doesn't make a bit of difference. If God's word says it, to not be associated with darkness, then don't do it. I mean, it's, it's simple as falling off a log, isn't it? So don't ever do anything that you, you know for sure is contrary to the word of God. And uh, so that's, that's the faith that pleases God, knowing that you're going to make that choice and God's going to honor it. It's not jumping off the edge, okay? It's, uh, it's kind of like I, I heard of a little boy. Uh, he was standing on the porch. His daddy was down underneath the porch along with one of his friends. And he, daddy would hold his arms out and a little boy would jump in his arms. And he did that. He just climbed back up steps and he kept doing it and kept doing it. And uh, his dad got distracted and the friend of his daddy's said, here, jump to me. And he wouldn't do it. He refused. And he said, why not? And he said, I know my daddy can catch me. I don't know if you can or not. See, faith, faith in God. And uh, God-pleasing faith always brings forth results. Look at verses uh, 6 and 7 here in, in this passage. And when they had do uh, this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. They beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. It always brings forth results. Now, the, the Lord wanted them to catch fish, but he wanted them to catch fish for his honor and glory. Is a, there's a big difference in bringing forth fruit and bringing forth fruit unto God. And that's applicable to your own spiritual life. It's applicable to the church life. Whatever you do as a church needs to bring honor and glory to God. And whatever you do as a believer in your personal relationship 
or the Lord should bring honor and glory to God. God-pleasing faith brings forth humility. Look at verse 8 and 9. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. Now, I think the seedbed of faith is us accepting our own weaknesses and our own helplessness. Until we're willing to become humble before God, will never be worth a plug nickel to him. I have seen people who are actually so proud of their self and their accomplishments that they really can't stand to be around normal people. They think so highly of themselves. You know, if only God did, right? Um, I'm sure the devil does, but if only God did. We, we always we have to come to this conclusion that in our own strength, in our own intelligence, in our own power, we can do absolutely nothing worth anything for God. Amen. Only until a person has humbled himself before God can he do anything. I knew that the day I got saved. I knew it. Nobody had to, had to sit me down and teach it to me. I knew, and I said that day, that if anything comes out of this decision, it'll be because God did it. Because I, I'd already given up on myself. And I don't know even if a person can even get saved until they give up on their self. I heard of a, of, a, of a big Baptist church one time where a fellow walked the aisle at the invitation. He come up and he held his hand out about halfway down the aisle, kept it outstretched till he got to the preacher, and he said, Preacher, shake hands with the next governor of this state. I don't know. I, you know, I've seen people come forward in these big uh, evangelistic crusades popping, chewing gum, and laughing and carrying on. And I'm thinking, what, what's going on here? Am I that much different than everybody else? God broke my heart with my sins. I had nothing to be proud of. Still don't. Other than the fact that I know Jesus, I'm proud of that. But we have to give up on ourselves. It, it, uh, God-pleasing faith brings forth humility. If uh, you get too successful, it's... Uh, it can be a trap. I think success has destroyed more people than failure has. Okay? I guess you got farther to fall <laughs> if you're successful. But uh, people say, look what I've done. I tell you, now I'm, I'm an independent fundamental Baptist from the word go. But I've seen a lot of independent fundamental Baptists that I'm worried about. I really am. Look what we've done. They're always bragging about it, you know. Look how many people we've got. Look how few you got, right? Well, somebody's got to pastor the little churches too, don't they? Hey, I, I, I was down in Crow, West Virginia. I, I wasn't in uh, Charlotte or one of those big places where they got hundreds of thousands of people hanging around. And you get down in Crow, see what you can get dig out down there, okay? Like at the Preacher's Fellowship one time, I didn't go to too many of them because too much bragging going on. But I went to one and fellow said, he said, where are, you, where are you at? And I said, Crow, West Virginia. How many people y'all running down there? I said, about a thousand. He said, really? A th I impressed him. He said, a thousand. I said, yeah, we're running a thousand. I said, but we ain't caught but about a hundred of them yet. <laughs> didn't, he didn't know how to handle that. So when you hear somebody bragging about what they've done, I won this many to the Lord. I did this. I did that. They didn't do anything. If anybody got one to the Lord, the Lord won them to himself. And there's only one teacher, and that's the Holy Spirit of God. So we've got nothing to brag about. God takes us weak and uh, as weak as we can be, and then he will use us if we'll stay that way. We're only strong in the Lord, not in herself. So look what God has done. That should be, that should be what, what we say. But Paul says... In Romans 3.27, where is boasting then? He said it is, it is excluded. And we grow one step closer to the Lord. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Right? I remember uh, some kids in school that hadn't studied for their test. 
So I came by and they said, Brother Burks, pray for me. I said, what do you need? They said, I, want to, I need to pass this test. I said, did you study? They said, well, no, not really. I said, prepare to fail. They were trying to claim that verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me, but that's not what that verse is talking about, taking tests and things. It's not talking about us being lazy and getting out of a bunch of stuff and then claiming something. Through Christ which strengthened me. And then look at verse 10 and 11. It says, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. God-pleasing faith leads to total surrender. Y'all have, I guess y'all have that song in your hymnal, uh, I Surrender All. I tell you, it's hard to sing that song, really. And when you think about it, have we really? You know, sometimes I just shut up. I don't, I don't even try to sing it because it, it, it makes me wonder, have I really surrendered all? Am I holding on to anything? I mean, that's, those are powerful words. That's a powerful statement to say I, I've surrendered all. Now, about three years after this passage here, Christ would tell these same men, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everybody talks about total surrender. You won't find a preacher that don't talk about that. And everybody's talking about doing great things for the Lord. But the truth of it is, most are not willing to exercise simple daily obedience to the Lord. Right? We're going to go and conquer the world. We're going to evangelize the whole world. But we don't want to walk across the street to our neighbor's house. I, I don't know how we, how we can excuse that. They want to go into all the world tomorrow. But they're not willing to let down their net today. See, we're only living today. Give us this day our daily bread. It's only three days we need to concern ourselves with. That's yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. You can't do anything about that. Nothing's going to change it. Tomorrow, that may never get here. And we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The only day we are concerned about, really, is today. What are we doing right now? Okay, right now. Well, if these men hadn't let that net down, if they hadn't been obedient and not doubted, they would never have had the faith to forsake all and follow Jesus. But God builds us up step by step in our faith. Maybe, uh, and you never know, Maybe there's somebody that God has called to do something. Before I ever even dreamed about preaching, and that, that would have been a nightmare for me. <laughs> even though I was saved, that would have been a nightmare. Uh, but even before then, I, rem I remember I had to be obedient in a lot of things that God put in front of me. You know, would I, would I give up my time to do whatever it was, dig a ditch, paint a room, you know, mix cement, whatever it was. I've done all those things. Clean toilets, I've done it all. What if I hadn't done that? Then the next opportunity come up. What if I hadn't drove the bus when they needed a bus driver? What if I hadn't led the singing when they needed a song leader? What if I hadn't done? Who would have, right? But each time that I surrendered to the Lord just this little part, God blessed it. And that made it when he asked me to do something else and laid something else on my heart, I was, I'd say, yeah, God helped me in the past. God, God strengthened me in the past, so let me, let me try this. And I'd always say, God, you helped me. Well, he always did. And so one thing evolves into another and another evolves into another. You, never, you don't know how far God's going to take you. 
But I, I know you have to surrender to each step along the way. You know, maybe I would tell people as a pastor, I, they would say, I, I, don't, I don't think I can do it. I'd like, to, I'd like to be able to do it. I don't know if I can do it. I said, well, won't you just try it then? And if you can't do it, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? And find something else. Everybody can't work with teenagers. They'd, they'd be in jail. <laughs> lot, most people, most older people are afraid of teenagers. They're afraid of them. They don't want anything to do with them. I raised three. I, I, I didn't hardly want nothing to do with them when they was in their heyday. So you, you, you do what God would have you to do, but you have to surrender to it. Maybe you tried to do something, and you couldn't do it. You say, I, I can't do that. Well, that would put you down there with what Peter said when he said, Master, we've toiled all the night, taken nothing. Isaiah, he said, the Lord said, you know, who shall we send? Who, who will go for us? And he said, here I am. Here, here my Lord, send me. And, he, and the, the craziest thing, God says to him, Isaiah, I'm going to send you out to this bunch. They're not going to listen to you. They, they're not going to hear you. They're not going to do what you say. They're not going to do any of this stuff, okay? But you go anyway. As long as you're obedient to God, the results are God's. It's not, it's not ours. So, I think a lot of people are perhaps discouraged by reports from others. They, they're discouraged because they don't have instant results. I remember as a pastor, we went through what I would call spiritually dry spells, <laughs> desert places, where you would go month after month after month, and nothing would happen. It didn't matter how hard you preached. It didn't matter how many homecomings you had. It didn't matter if you brought singers in. It didn't matter what. Nothing happened. But I found out if I'd just stay faithful, stay with the stuff, God would always bring the increase in his time, not, not my time. Well, when you get your mind off of catching fish, which is the thing at hand, whatever it is, ushering, driving a bus, teaching a class, working in the nursery, sweeping the floor, whatever it may be, when you get your mind off of that, off of catching the fish, and you get your mind on obeying the Lord while you're sweeping the floor and driving the bus and doing all these other things. Whether or not you can do it is not the issue. The issue is this. Did God tell you to do it? It don't matter if I can do it. If God told me to do it, it don't matter if I think I'm able to do it. It don't even matter if I, if I don't do it, as long as I try. What matters is that God told me to. I'm not responsible then, right? I'm not responsible if people get saved, believe it or not. God's responsible for saving people. I'm only responsible for telling people how, giving them the good news. I know guys that's hunted for 50 years, turkey hunted for 50 years and never killed a turkey. You'd think they'd quit, wouldn't you? Well, I know what it is. One, either there ain't no turkeys where they're hunting. <laughs> or two, they're moving around too much. And they're letting the turkeys see them first. But they stay after it. Yes, they do. I hope, I hope they kill one before they die. If God called me to preach, and I had to preach for 50 years, and I never seen an increase in the church size, and i never seen people come forward. But God told me to. You know, if God told me to, then I've got to do it. And then people may, may not even be saved. I don't know. I've had people say, I've tried to be a Christian. Well, that's the problem. You can't try to be a Christian. <laughs> and uh, trust their own ability to get their own self to heaven. It's trusting Christ and letting him save us. Then you say, I've toiled all the night. 
I'm no better for it. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried to do better and I've tried this and I've, I've thought this and, and I, just ha- I just can't do it. That's because we're trying. You see, when Christ saves you, you can quit trying, man. You can just start doing. Do it. Whatever it is, do it. Come to church, do it. Pray, do it. Open your Bible up and read it, do it, right? Try, try to learn, do it. Rightly divide the word of God, you can do it. That's where you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. But do we have the kind of faith that pleases God? So I have faith, what kind is it, right? And does it please God? I, I find one of the uh, characteristics of the day we're living in is people are praying, but they're not believing, right? They're praying for somebody to get healed, and at the same time, they're telling you that they're almost dead. You know, I've, I've seen that lately. Somebody said, let's pray for this person. they got a couple of days left. They don't know that. With God on your side, I would never give up. I don't care what the doctors say. I don't care what they pronounce on you. Don't ever give up. That's God's business. Our business is to pray and believe and have faith. So it's the kind of faith, here's the kind of faith we're talking about. You don't rely on your own abilities, okay? So maybe tonight, I always, look, I, I tell people I like to fish, but I like to catch fish, right? <laughs> I don't like just fish for the cause of fishing. I like to feel the line pull away from me. I like to bring them in, right? I like something as a result of what I'm trying to do. So when we pray, we want answers, If all we do is pray, we won't answer. So we get specific with it. To obey is better than sacrifice. You you have to let faith overcome doubt. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So that kind of uh, faith operates on the evidence of God's word. Look, if God said it, and you put it in its context, you can take that to the bank. You can cash that. Now, if God didn't say it, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. But is God answering your prayers? God-pleasing faith should bring an answer to prayer. If we're going to pray, pray is ask, prayer is asking. The answer to prayer is receiving. Okay. Now, I know there's different elements to prayer. But that's b- the basic definition of prayer. I'm going to ask God, right? And then what do I expect? By faith, I expect him to answer that prayer. Now he can answer it. No, he has that option. He knows more than we do. But uh, it brings forth results. It causes us to humble ourselves and exalt Christ, right? I like, uh, I like, I like churches that exalt Christ that make a lot of him right less of ourselves I had a guy one time he he was going to give some money to the church and he come and told me he was going he told me I'm going to give some money and he had a big envelope cash money and uh, so I said well whatever God leads you to do so he come up to me again and he said now how are we going to do this I said do what he said how, how am I going to go about giving this money um I said, well, I'll, I'll, you put it in the offering plate, I guess. He said, well, uh, well, do you want to call me up or do you up front or do you just want me to come up front? I said, for what? I said, for what? And he wanted, you know, he was one of those guys wanted recognized for. I said, look, buddy, I, God forbid that I'd steal a man's reward from him. You know, I'll get you up here and brag on you. That's all you'll ever get out of it. You keep it to yourself. Let God bless you. Don't blow a hypocrite like the, I mean, don't blow a trumpet like the hypocrites do. We've, we've been told that. It's humility, knowing what we are, knowing who he is. And that's the kind of faith that will, will lead to total surrender. Okay? Deepen your fellowship with the Lord through worship, through the Bible, and through service. 
And God will lead you to total surrender to whatever. But the question in tonight is this, pretty simple. Does my faith please God? Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So maybe that will give you something to think about tonight when you're laying there trying to go to sleep (laughs) or in the days to come. Just test your faith. Gauge your faith. Does it please God? And, um, hey, he'll help you. He'll reward you. He'll bless your life for it. Now, they they said, uh, uh, Brother Roger usually just dismisses in prayer, so that's what we'll do. But let me say this. If you'd like to talk to me about any of this, I'm available, okay? I'll be glad to speak with you in private, to have prayer with you. But you want your faith to be what God wants it to be, for sure, okay? Well, let's pray, and we'll be dismissed tonight. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Thank you that we were able to gather together tonight around the Word of God. And, Lord, we just pray that Uh, Father, we'll learn uh, from a study of your word uh, that we'll grow as believers. God, that we'll we'll be able to serve you in a greater way. Lord, we realize, Father, that we're weak, helpless, Lord, without you. And God, we just pray that you'll overcome us by your power. Strengthen us from day to day. And Lord, we look forward to that day when we'll be with you. Until then, Lord, help us to be active in your service. God, I pray you'll dismiss us from this place tonight. Bless these people. Bless this church. And God, may you have your way with each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. So, folks, I guess you're dismissed, okay? <laughs>